Uh, I'm Mark Plattner, the co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and vice president for research and studies here at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to today's panel on the global campaign against democratic norms. Uh, given the great interest that's been shown in this event as reflected in the large crowd uh, that's here, uh, it looks as if there's no need to justify the importance uh, of our topic. This session is an outgrowth of a research project on the resurgence of authoritarianism that NED's International Forum for Democratic has been working on since early last year. This effort, guided by the forum's executive director, Chris Walker, began with individual country studies of what we've called the big five authoritarian powers, China, Russia, Venezuela, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. And articles on each of these countries appeared in either the January or the April 2015 issue of the Journal of Democracy. The second phase of the project looks in a thematic fashion at the key arenas in which, and other authoritarians, to erode the international norms that may endanger their survival. And the new July 2015 issue of the journal, which we've just received advanced copies of, um, three such thematic articles. <coughs> First, Alexander Cooley writing on the assault on democratic standards and practices in global and regional organizations. Debert on the conflicts over the rules governing cyberspace. And third, Pat Merlot on the attempts to undermine impartial domestic and international monitoring of elections. Pat spoke here on this last subject at a public meeting that we convened in February. And today we have with us the authors of the two other articles featured in the current issue of the journal, Alexander Cooley and Ron Deber, uh, as well as Steve Heidemann and Christopher Sabatini, who studied the assault on international <coughs> democratic norms in the Middle East and Latin America, respectively. Before introducing our panelists, let me just note that the October issue of the Journal of Democracy will contain articles on what the authoritarians are doing to boost their presence in the international media landscape and to impose tight restrictions on civil society organizations. Two additional soft power arenas in which they're posing a growing challenge to the democracies. And early next year, Johns Hopkins University will be publishing a Journal of Democracy book collecting all these essays. Tentatively entitled The Authoritarian it will include an introduction by Chris Walker, who will also co-edit the, co the volume, along with Larry Diamond and me. And I also want to call your attention to the forum's new website at www.resurgentdictatorships.com, which provides regular news about the authoritarian challenge to democracy. Now let me say just a few words about our panelists, each of whom will make an initial presentation of about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, Alexander Cooley is professor of political science at Barnard College and the newly appointed director of Columbia University's Harriman Institute for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies. His research examines how external actors, including international organizations, multinational companies, NGOs, and foreign military bases, have influenced the development and sovereignty of the former Soviet states, with a particular focus on Central Asia and the and His latest book is Great Games, Local Rules, The New Great Power Contest for Central Asia. Uh, Ronald Debert is Professor of Political Science at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto and Director of its Citizen Lab, an interdisciplinary research and development hothouse working at the intersection of the internet, global security, and human rights. 
He's published numerous articles, chapters, and books on issues related to technology, media, and world politics. He was also one of the authors of the Tracking GhostNet report that documented an alleged cyber espionage network affecting over 1,200 computers in 103 countries. Benjamin is now the professor, now professor and Janet W. Ketchum, 1953 Chair in Middle East Studies at Smith College in Massachusetts. Uh, he specializes in the comparative politics and political of the Middle East, with a particular focus on the served Vice President of Applied Research on Conflict at the U.S. Institute of Peace, as Director of the Center for Democracy and Civil Society at Georgetown, as an Associate Professor of Political Science at Columbia, Columbia University, and as Director of the Social Science Research Council's Program on International Peace and Security and its Program on the Near and Middle East. And Christopher Sabatini is an Adjunct Professor of Affairs at Columbia University and the editor of Latin America Goes Global. He formerly served as the Senior Director of Policy at the American Society and the Council of the Americas. He is founder and editor-in-chief of its hemispheric policy magazine, America's Quarterly, which he launched in 2007. From 1997 to 2005, uh, he was here as director for Latin America and the Caribbean uh, at NED. He's published numerous articles on Latin America, democratization, political parties, and the effectiveness of international programs to support democratic development. Those of you who are on Twitter can follow this session and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at Think Democracy or the endowment at NEDemocracy. If you've not already done so, uh, please join me in silencing your cell phones. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Alex Cooley. Alex? <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Mark. And, uh, Thank you to Chris Walker for this, uh, this initiative that's been just deeply enriching and rewarding to be a part of, and to Mark and his team at the JOD for, um, um, for all their expert guidance in putting together this article. I, I, I came to this topic in a really roundabout way. Uh, I'm you know, roughly a Central Asianist by trade. <laughs> if I said I was a Eurasianist, it would connote something. <laughs> <laughs> And I wrote this book, Great Games, Local Rules, a few years ago. And in it, I sort of, one of the arguments I made is that, you know, we, we tend to view Central Asia harping back to empires and imperial competition and traditions and all this thing. But what if instead Central Asia was a very forward-looking region, right? What if it actually gave us a window on global governance dynamics challenges to materialize? And so... Um, you know, originally, uh, with my sort of Central Asian trends and examples, I would uh, look at China's rise, Russia's backlash against the Western-led norms agenda, then the central um, the decline of U.S. and Western soft power, even as they voluntarily engaged in the region. And all this time, sort of Central Asian states figuring out how to navigate these dynamics, how to play one power off another, and how to innovate especially on the values issues themselves. And so I'm, I'm sort of trained in looking at Central Asia, but then I started to see some patterns in other parts of the world. And, you know, I think Steve and Chris uh, will bring out the nuances of Latin America and Middle East um, and, you know, some of the unique things going on there. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I think there are some commonalities across each of the regions. Uh, they might not be as intense as in Eurasia, um, but certainly, uh, there. I think the the fundamental off point here for me, uh, kind of revisiting a lot of the academic and scholarly literature on which some of these policy assumptions were built from the 1990s regarding the external and democracy promotion, and really I want to challenge, or not challenge, you know, problematize. I think kind of three distinct areas and groups of actors that used to be democracy promoters, incubators of democratic values, um, and now uh, uh, are no longer 
performing the task in the same effective, robust way. Uh, I sort of premise uh, 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 all of this on an observation that, you know, in opposition to sort of liberal democratic values, you're seeing in various parts of the world the emergence of kind of, you know, at least three, I, I flag three in the piece, distinct forms of counter norms, right? The first deals with uh, counterterrorism um, and security and order, um, and that includes practices like um, you know, creating, you know, parallel institutions and processes uh, for sort of extremist and accused terrorists. It means doing away with judicial procedures, creating common warrants, uh, uh, increasing surveillance, um, these kinds of justifications. What Kim Lane Shepsley, I think, was very uh, nicely sort of termed sort of this, creating a permanent state of emergency. And her observation is, while in the 1990s you saw the expansion of constitutional trends because of this kind of global post 9 the state of emergency, you've seen uh, an anti constitutional trend in the 2000s. Um, so I think that's uh, one, one dimension to it. Um, I think there's also, uh, talking about kind of different security agendas, there's been a kind of a ratcheting um, and networking. It's at the regional level have come to sort of uh, mutually recognize uh, pet security concern and legitimacy. Um, so for example, you know, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Central Asian states have acquiesced to sort of China's identification of um, Uyghurs as an extremist group uh, that, that, that destabilized the region. Or you've seen Russia uh, actually list some groups and organizations that previously had safe space in Russia on behalf of the Central Asian governments, um, you know, labeling, again, extremist organizations. Um, but I think all part of this is, is a kind of a ratcheting up of who's an extremist uh, on that list to include sort of political opponents. I think the second sort of counter norm that I see is the civilizational diversity and sovereignty. Um, and I think this is most well known in the kind of non-interference doctrines behind a lot of China's um, uh, a regional institution building, engagement on uh, uh, de uh, development assistance. The idea that uh, civilization has its virtues and merits and we shouldn't criticize them, um, and certainly we shouldn't interfere in each other's foreign affairs. Um, this idea is embodied in the so-called Shanghai spirit of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. There's been some work on how the Shanghai spirit is anti-democratic um, um, by nature. Uh, I, I, I think there's certain cause for concerns there. I, I, I saw the new uh, declaration from the summit that just happened in, in, in Nufa, and um, very interesting article there about uh, how uh, rights and human rights um, uh, are all civilizationally uh, uh, contextual, how the thing as the universality of these issues and how states should be free to promote these values in their own way. So it, it's starting to be fleshed out even in official sort of SEO uh, documents. But this again, sovereignty, non-interference, um, very strong. Of course, I would argue it creates real problems organizations when you can't intervene in each other's sovereign affairs because you never actually had meaningful regional cooperation, integration, and supranationalism. But I think that's one of the kind of really fascinating analytical tensions I see in the SCO as an organization. Um, and then the final counter norm that's out there um, is this traditional values agenda. And that's been associated uh, uh, with uh, Moscow's push of this issue. Um, sometimes uh, uh, Alexander Lukin wrote an interesting article for Foreign Affairs on kind of the moral decay of the West and the, how the traditional values agenda addresses a lot of the blindnesses of liberalism. And to also copycat sense of this, um, certainly uh, LGBT propaganda law in Kyrgyzstan, um, you know, anti-NGO legislation, um, and so forth. So uh, that's another one of this. Um, also some moves by Russia with allied, uh, with some, uh, uh, I believe, Arab League countries um, in the UN to push a traditional values resolution and agenda that got through. It was contentious, uh, but, it, but, but, but it got through. So, so that, that, I think, would be sort of the third.
sort of counter norm out there. So what are the vehicles that are spreading these? And again, um, I, I, I see kind of three clusters. First is a broad NGO crackdown, right? In the 90s, we sort of viewed activists as not having borders, a very famous book about this. We saw uh, NGOs as being able to occupy these spaces that states couldn't. We saw them be really savvy, nimble, outfox states by sort of having national partners and allied governments sympathetic to them and apply boomerang pressures. And, and really what we see over the last 10 years, and for me, my part of the world, the turning point is the color revolutions of the early and mid 2000s, is governments have taken this seriously, they've learned, and they have conflated a lot of these NGO activities with security threats, right? Viewing them as destabilizing their regimes as a internal security matter. And they've devolved, developed an anti-NGO playbook. And, you know, this restrictive NGO legislation that we see mushroom everywhere in the world. Um, foreign registration types of restrictions uh, and funding restrictions, right? And according to one study by James Ron, his research team, sort of they identified 45 individual laws restricting foreign funding uh, across countries, and the number's just been growing, especially over the last 10 years. Uh, also, Jim and his co-authors of an excellent piece in review of international political economy, one of our first case studies of this law in Ethiopia, find that uh, not only was the anti-NGO law in Ethiopia effective is absolutely devastating, <laughs> that basically uh, groups that were involved in political rights and human rights were just folded. And by their account, about 90% of the groups changed uh, their organizational mission. So the point is, this is mushrooming around the world because it works, right? Governments are finding that there's a lot of penalties for clamping down on NGOs, uh, even if there might be some sort of mild uh, program. Um, so that, I think that's, that's, that's one uh, aspect of this. At the same time, uh, funding and sponsoring uh, state-sponsored NGOs, right? So phenomenon is really important. Um, we've talked a lot about here at the net zombie election monitors, right? Uh, election monitors that uh, are typical of elections that emulate the form but not the substance of election monitoring uh, and so forth. So, so I think this is, this is uh, uh, you know, NGOs themselves are being displaced by, by other uh, uh, types of institutions that, that muddy the waters in, in, in Chris Walker's formulation. Second category of actors, organizations. Again, in the 90s, scholars viewed regional organizations as, in, in general, as probably promoting democratic norms. Why? Because they were founded on rule of law, transparency, clear procedures to have super had some sort of you know, rationalization of your bureaucratic structure, cooperation. You had the conditionalities of the EU accession process, of NATO even. Uh, you had the values agenda uh, in the OSCE. And what you see now are international organizations or regional organizations that are actually uh, serving not as a conduit for democratic norms, but as a against democratic norms, right? And I see kind of two to this. One is in the kind of hard version of this, under anti-terrorism treaties, um, security treaties, two organizations, the SCO and the GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council, very similar uh, documents that empower the extradition of political opponents based on just accusation, no kind bypassing national um, extradition asylum processes, development of common blacklists of uh, political opponents, and then the target of civil society operating um, in member countries and their renditioning over to security services of other countries. But there's another dimension of this, and I think Chris will talk about this more in the Latin American context, that a lot of these emerging powers that we thought would lead uh, in these institutions actually seem very reluctant to criticize their fellow members um, for their democratic failings. Um, and I think this is wrapped up in concerns about their status and their legitimacy as leaders. They don't want to be seen as imposing themselves the way, say, you know, the US or Western powers did or so forth. So that, so even if in regional organizations that are, have democratic norms on the books, you see sort of a reluctance to enforce them by a lot of these middling powers. And then the final area here is what I call um, the West is losing its monopoly as a provider of public goods, 
right? Development assistance is a big part of this. We see sort of, you know, Chinese-led efforts uh, to build infrastructure, offer development aid, the Gulf states and their funding. Uh, and what this does is, yes, there are norms associated with this, sort of a kind of a, uh, kind of a perception that this is very effective, but it also allows target countries to play off um, these new emerging lenders off Western lenders and try and dumb down the conditionalities, especially on the political and also the associated with Western engagement. There's a media component to this too. Traditionally, the West was the world's provider of information on an international, transnational level, no longer. RT, probably talked a lot about, but CCTV too, which boasts 22 bureaus, not stringers in Africa, 12 in Latin America. And what aspect of this, not only what but doesn't, that news feeds themselves from the wires are much cheaper to purchase from these uh, uh, state-run media outfits or Xinhua than they are, say, right? So you're creating this system of feeding coverage that neglects, at best, these issues, uh, and, at, and, and then, at worst, sort of uh, covers them in an unfavorable light. So uh, these three areas, then, regional organizations, NGO crackdown, displacement of the West as the sole international public goods provider, has created an environment um, that's very much now either blocking or actively pushing back against liberal democracy. Um, you know, I have a couple of policy recommendations in the piece about what can be done about this. I mean, I think, just very briefly, one might be appeal to international in things like data sharing practices or election monitoring and so forth, um, especially when you engage with an organization like SEO. Talk about why aren't they following standards for listing and delisting in terms of their, their blacklist. Then my final recommendation um, I'm not sure how well, well thought out this is, is a lot of this behavior in emerging powers is driven by prestige and status considerations. I think it's time to sort of try uh, and, and point out that adherence um, to good standards, good governance, democratic norms itself is something um, that has prestige in it. And here my, 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 my sort of analogy is humanitarian work. Right, that uh, a lot of these countries undertake new humanitarian missions because they view it as part of the status of what an important country does. Um, but with that come certain best practices. And I think sort of recoding democratic norms as best practices, appealing to the leadership of these countries might also be a way to go as opposed to just criticizing them for, for their sins of omission. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. And next we'll hear from Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, NED. Uh, let me also um, uh, emphasize and, and reinforce uh, Alex's comment about the Counter Norms Initiative at, at NED. I think it really has been one of the most important efforts to try and take stock of changes in um, the dynamics of authoritarian governance globally over the last few years, and, and I, I think NED deserves a great deal of credit for launching and, and sustaining it, and I'm very pleased to have the chance to participate uh, on this panel, but also in the, in the broader project uh, of which it is a part. Um, Alex introduced a number of issues that I think you'll see um, help to thread our various presentations together. What I'd like to do uh, today is to try and summarize where we've come in terms of governance in the Middle East in the more than four years since the launch of the Arab uprisings in, in 2011. And I want to focus in particular on uh, authoritarian and how the uprisings have transformed patterns of authoritarian governance in the Middle East, in large part through efforts by the authoritarian regimes that survived the uprisings in 2011 to um, uh, exploit practices that will support the consolidation of what we've been defining as counter norms. And as we move through what is now the fourth year, four and a half years uh, since the start of the uprisings, I think everyone in this room would agree that the governance picture in the region has changed quite dramatically and unfortunately has not uh, changed for the better, except for one case, Tunisia, uh, which is now, of course, confronting quite significant challenges in its own right. We've seen a very systematic decline uh, 
in possibilities for political transitions, for democratic political change pretty much across the region. And we have some fairly vivid indicators of the extent to which that is the case. If we look, for example, at the overall regional scores concerning the Middle East put out by Freedom House in 2015, what we find is that four years since the uprisings began, the Middle East today is the second least free region in the world. The gaps between the Middle East and other world regions are enormous. The first place position is held, Alex, I'm sorry to say, by Eurasia. Eurasia is 0% free in the 2015. MENA is 5% free. And that includes the state of Now, as gloomy as that ranking might be, it's an improvement over 2014. In 2014, the MENA region was considered to be 2% free. It held down the lead position as the least free region. The difference has to do with Tunisia. In 2015, Tunisia was rated fully free by Freedom House, the first time a country in the Middle East, an Arab country, uh, had received a fully, re, fully free rating since Lebanon in the 1970s. But nonetheless, I think we have to recognize that these regional scores are a very troubling signal of broader trends in the erosion of, of possibilities for, for, um, for political transitions, democratic change in the region. And we see these trends reflected at the country level. It's very clear by now. I doubt there uh, are many who challenge uh, the observation that President Sisi is very clearly driving Egypt in a more repressive direction. The regional security environment with four collapsed and conflict-affected states uh, in, in, in the region, Libya, Yemen, and, and Iraq, a very troubling uh, surge in violent extremism across the region. All of these conditions tend to reinforce perceptions among the regimes that survived the uprisings of 2011 that they need to at home and ensure economic and social stability, political stability, by any means necessary. And what we find is that as these trends are reported in the media, as we hear policymakers and officials talking about these trends, the kind of language that they use often conveys the impression that what the region is experiencing is a pattern of authoritarian regression, a kind of back to the future moment in authoritarian governance in the Arab world. But this is where I would encourage us to be very, very careful about drawing too tight a connection between the modes of authoritarian governance that we see taking shape in the Middle East today and those that existed in the pre-uprising period. I'd argue that something different is happening. What I would argue is that what we're seeing today is not simply a process of authoritarian reassertion, but is, in effect, uh, a further and troubling step in the transformation of authoritarian governance in, in the Arab world. And, and this is a transformation that I think can best be captured by identifying two distinct models of authoritarianism toward which many of the countries in the region are moving. The first is a model that I would characterize as authoritarian 2.0. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, the second, and I think far more troubling model, is one I'd characterize as the emergence of repressive, exclusionary models of authoritarian governance that I view as marking a significant shift from strategies of authoritarian rule prior to the uprising that I would define as more inclusive, populist, and redistributive. Concerning the first model, uh, Upgrading 2.0, I, I did a paper for Brookings some years ago that identified a number of different elements uh, associated with this broad strategy of authoritarian upgrading. Some of them that Alex mentioned in connection to the trends that he witnessed in, in uh, Eurasia, Central Asia, sorry, Central Asia. Um, things like appropriating and containing civil societies, managing, Station, 
capturing the benefits of selective economic reform, controlling communications technologies, diversifying international linkages to insulate regimes from Western pressure. But I'd add a sixth, actually, in the post-2011 context, and that's exploiting legal and regulatory mechanisms to criminalize a wide range of activities that are identified as oppositional. I'm not going to go into these in, in any detail. We don't have a great deal of time uh, this afternoon. But I do want to make the point that, in effect, the upgrading uh, strategy, the upgrading framework, identifies a set of mechanisms or tactics that regimes in the Middle East have been using to advance the consolidation of these authoritarian counter norms, consolidate their hold on power give themselves the veneer of legitimacy, give themselves the veneer that they are governing on the basis of the rule of law, um, when in, in fact what they are doing is using these tactics to shore up increasingly heavy-handed authoritarian systems of rule. And what across the region since 2011 uh, is that regimes have responded to the resurgence of mass politics, to the to the very distinctive challenges posed by the threat of politics from below by working to consolidate counter norms through these six. They've done this in some ways that um, are, are common uh, across the region, but they've also done this in ways that I think are moving the region toward these two authoritarian types that I've uh, identified in, in my comments. What we have in a small number of cases, like Morocco, Jordan, uh, some of the Gulf states, is that regimes um, are not only adopting these tactics of authoritarian upgrading, but they're turning them in a much a heavy, more heavy-handed, more repressive kind of exclusionary direction. They're more sharply constraining civil societies, they're expanding controls on the media and on communications technology. They've moved to more fully shift their diplomatic relationships away from some of their traditional Western partners. And what they've also done in a very troubling fashion is to put in place very dense webs of legislation and regulatory controls that tighten regime uh, authority over almost any kind of activity that could be identified as oppositional, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, including, of course, um, incredibly tight constraints on the work of international NGOs that might want to engage with local partners in these countries. So in effect, these regimes have an abandoned upgrading, uh, even if things can be seen in some respects as marking the limits of upgrading some of its failures, they haven't abandoned these tactics. They're simply modifying them to respond to the challenges of mass politics. But we have a second set of cases. The parts of Syria governed by the Assad regime, Egypt, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, for example, where we're seeing these very authoritarian governance move in what I would view as much darker and more troubling directions toward these more repressive and exclusionary systems of rule. Egypt, to me, stands out very clearly as a leading example of this trend. They've reshaped and, in many cases, moved to narrow the social bases on which the regimes depend uh, through a variety of different mechanisms. They've expanded the roles and the influence of security apparatuses and the military. One of the interesting um, developments we've seen alongside the proliferation of failed states in the region is the incredible strengthening of states that are threatened by those um, failed and conflict-affected states, but with a real focus on the strengthening of security apparatuses in the military. And I think this is going to have a significant long-term effect on state building and on governance in the region. What they've also done uh, is to take much more far-ranging steps to reorient their diplomatic relationships toward um, supportive authoritarian allies, although this takes different forms in some of the different blocks of regimes in the region. In the case of Egypt, it's the Gulf states and Russia that are emerging now as increasingly important partners. But in the Syrian case and some other cases, what we find is that it's Russia and Iran that are playing a kind of parallel role 
as um, providing networks of authoritarian allies who who support and and due to the the stability and governance of um, of these these local these local clients. So where does this leave us in terms of uh, authoritarian governance and counter norms in, in in the Middle East? I think one obvious and disturbing conclusion is that if we look at the impact of the Arab uprising since 2011, one of the conclusions we can reach is that perhaps their most significant and far-ranging effect has been to accelerate processes of authoritarian transformation, uh, deepen regime efforts to consolidate these authoritarian counter norms, and move the region along a couple of different pathways toward more repressive, more narrowly based much more insular forms of authoritarian governance embedded in global authoritarian networks that increase their resilience. And I think one of the outcomes of this is to create an environment in which both local reformers and external supporters of processes of political reform are going to find a much less congenial, much more challenging environment in which to work than even the very difficult context that tended to define their efforts the past couple of decades. And in the context of this quite extraordinary level of regional turmoil, which reinforces perceptions among authoritarian survivors, as they call them, of regime vulnerability and regime insecurity, and together with the emergence of local constituencies in support of the law and order uh, strategies of some of these authoritarian survivors, the broader environment uh, in which authoritarian governance is being transformed in the region is going to pose a, a very, very daunting challenge uh, in the development of policies and strategies to try to um, mitigate, uh, much less reverse, this broad trend. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for those very clear, if not very encouraging uh, remarks. <laughs> I don't get paid to be encouraging. That's the problem. <laughs> now we'll hear from uh, Chris Sabatini. I don't think there'll be too many happy <laughs> stories. <today. laughs> well, uh, again, I want to echo, um, first of all, my speakers, uh, previous speakers, Thanks for, to the NED and the forum for organizing this. I think it's a really important trend, and it, it, it deserves the attention it's getting. It deserves more. Uh, it obviously deserves um, more activism around these topics as well as we begin to sort of flesh it out and understand it more and its global implications. Um, comparison to, to Central Asia and to the Middle East, obviously Latin America is, has a far better tradition of election observation, uh, democracy, democratic regimes, human rights. Um, and one could argue that in the global south, Latin America is in many ways uh, was the example. It was far more advanced. It had a um, very, in terms of human rights institutions, it has the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, the Inter-American System of Human Rights um, that is based on, on uh, the Inter-American uh, Convention on Human Rights. Um, it had, which, and that system had defined in the 1980s uh, issue of disappearances and government's responsibility for disappearances under military dictatorships, and then later went on to define sort of what were or support free and fair elections, it began to define women's rights, freedom of expression. It developed a series of rapporteurs dedicated to freedom of expression, later LGBT rights and women's rights and indigenous rights. Um, and it also uh, established a series of precedent that was incorporated into judicial systems around the Americas. At the same time, uh, the Organization of American States uh, itself became a multilateral defender of democracy, first through Resolution, Resolution 1080, and then later through um, the Democratic Charter. That charter defined what is representative democracy, uh, of a balance of power uh, between in the checks and balances of democratic government, uh, freedom of expressions, uh, and also minority rights, and committed the 34-member uh, uh, OAS to defend uh, those institutions, not just in the case of a coup, but also in the case when they were under attack by an elected government through the erosion of those standards. Um, I would argue that these 
to electoral standards, election observation, the OES led the charge. We'll get Ruben Perino, who was there uh, at the OES in terms of at in critical moments of election observation in, in Peru, in the Dominican Republic, uh, in Nicaragua. The OES was critical in not just identifying fraud, but advancing the standards and the uh, ways in which we understood the way electoral fraud can't occur, and nipping in the bud efforts as more and more regimes came to learn to sort of buy elections or shift the playing field even before election day. That was probably the height of that moment was about eight to 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago. That's all changed. I'd like to point out that the height of that moment was just about the time I left the NED and it's gone down. <laughs> I'm not saying there's any causality, I'm just pointing it out. Um, the, um, anyway, What's happened uh, in the recent past has been the following. First has been the rise of China, and that is the first is financial, indirect, and direct financial. Indirect in terms of its voracious appetite for raw materials, the growth rates of countries like Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina, Ecuador, um, in ways that when, in the days of neoliberalism, which I do not, I do not say with a sneer, we always advocated the idea of rule of law and markets. Suddenly, those went out the window because China didn't demand those, and the demand for commodities was so great, um, these countries could ignore um, the basic sort of standards. And there comes also an ideological dimension to the rise of China. It suddenly gave another model. Um, as the neoliberal, neoliberal model was in disrepute, um, China seemed to offer another idea, that you could grow economically, that you could not have to follow rule of law, um, and that you could even not be democratic. And that alternative model was no small change. That occurred at the same time another thing happened in the region. That's the rise of Hugo Chavez, the rise of the Elba movement. Um, suddenly there were a group of countries that in fact wanted to believe that themselves and reflected that and saw that as an endorsement of their own uh, way. The third thing this was that China also then became a creator of institutions and an investor in money in these countries uh, without regard for transparency. So over $45 billion have been lent to Venezuela by China without oftentimes behind closed doors. Um, and in fact, China got the better of the deal um, in the long term because most of that money is going to be paid back in uh, oil at cut rate back to, back to China. So basically the Venezuelan government has mortgaged its future and the future of any future government to China. And the ways those investments were made, direct and indirect investments, seriously undermines sort of notions of transparency and exchange and even labor rights and environmental rights when it came to issues of natural resource extraction um, and uh, um, infrastructure, for example. What has happened uh, with this sort of dynamic of a rise of China and a rise of also Putin um, in, in Russia has been sort of a, a systematic attack on the institutions and processes and standards that I mentioned before. Um, I'd say there's sort of been two primary ways this has occurred in this sort of development of counter norms and the erosion of existing norms. On the erosion of existing norms, first of all, the Organization of American States and the inter-American system that I mentioned has been consistently on the attack from countries like Venezuela and Ecuador. These are countries that fundamentally reject the notion of no popular sovereignty overriding ideas of national sovereignty. And here comes the other thing that Alex mentioned and I will focus on is that the rise of China brought with it also, besides an alternative model for economic development and political development, it also brought with it a renewed notion of national sovereignty and a renewed notion of non-interference um, that has had, I would argue, a very pernicious effect on uh, you know, these norms over time. Um, and that touched a very deep nerve that's existed in Latin America for centuries. And this is actually that, that notion is very much in evidence even in the OAS uh, original charter. You notice these two trends of national sovereignty and non-interference, and the other is commitment to democratic. They're clearly fundamentally at, at, at polar opposites. You cannot defend democratic norms and at the same time agree with national sovereignty. Obviously, since the post-World War II order and the evolution of human rights is basically the basis of sort of our commitment to international commitment to defend and promote human rights and democracy. That notion of democracy and human rights within the hemisphere has been in the descendant. How has the OAS been under attack? Cleverly did. Was
the use of patronage, something that China is very effective at using. It, it has been engaging in a uh, giveaway oil program that has basically bought the votes of the Caribbean nations. Um, uh, Cuba receives over 100,000 barrels of oil a day from Venezuela. Um, some say as much of the Dominican Republic's GDP, as much as 5% of it depends on Venezuelan oil. Um, as well as using that oil patronage to buy the votes of Nicaragua, Bolivia, and a number of other countries. The second, so that basically wiped out the OAS's ability to defend democracy and even its own inter-American democratic charter. Um, but it, it second, what they did was engage in a very targeted campaign of basically stripping the inter-American system of its integrity and independence. Three years ago, Ecuador, uh, which was upset about a case that uh, had ruled against President for uh, tr taking out a suit for libel against a newspaper and a um, journalist, basically tried to strip the OAS of its um, independence by taking away its funding, limiting the ability to conduct country visits and issue country reports, and moving it to Buenos Aires, of all places. Um, the, um, what was surprising wasn't that Ecuador did that, nor that it had the support of Bolivia and Venezuela. What was surprising that it also had the tacit support of Brazil, Argentina. And let me just say parenthetically, Argentina at the time still is. The foreign minister, Hector Timmerman, is the son of Jacobo Timmerman, a man who's by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Hector Timmerman was quiet, even supported this entire package. It goes back to what Alex said before. The idea of regional solidarity is very profound. And that is, in fact, is what created a certain hypocrisy among many of these governments. Dilma Rousseff suffered under torture in her own government, now is actually stripping an institution or standing by while an institution gets stripped of its independence that would defend those rights. That reform proposal was eventually beaten back. Oh. So in but um, the former Constitutional Tribunal Justice, who was appointed by Correa, who had written and signed the communications law, which was criticized by the CPJ Committee to Protect Journalists, was just appointed to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This was Correa gave the Inter-American Court of Human Rights a big fat million dollar check. The former Supreme Court Justice of Argentina, Zaffaroni, was also just appointed. So again, the complicity of these other countries has been key to creating and sustaining either the gutting of these institutions or the creation of counter norms. I'll add one other point, I've got two minutes. The other thing that's happened has been the creation of alternative institutions, CELAC and UNASUR. CELAC is basically the OAS without the US and Canada. It's also the OAS, OAS without any norms, without any infrastructure, without any protocols. It is basically a shell organization. It has lots of good summits, and it makes some very interesting declarations, such as the last one they made in Cuba, which set back international human rights law decades, where basically their final declaration was, we assert that it is the fundamental right of any state to determine its own form of government. Think about, it. Think about where that takes us back, probably pre-World War II. Then there's UNASUR, the Association of uh, South American Nations. This was created in part by Brazil. It's supported and funded almost entirely by Brazil. It also does not have a very robust body of norms or institutions, but it does have one interesting thing. It has an election observation unit. And that election observation unit, by its own definition, is there to accompany the electoral process and the electoral commission in the management of elections. Imagine that. They're not just saying they're gonna show up on election day, they're saying they're there to certify what the government does on elections is all right. And indeed, that's what they did uh, in Venezuela. Now they're likely to do the same thing on December 6th at the uh, in Venezuelan legislative elections. They also, by fundamentally not having any sort of normative basis for their held in other efforts, such as the negotiation, the mediation in Venezuela between the opposition and the government. So there you have it. Uh, I would argue that the, um, the rise of China, the rise of these other countries, and, and the, the surprising, appalling silence of gov governments like Brazil, not just in these forums, but also obviously in the BRICS and other forums, um, has really created, given a license to more radical regimes to create institutions which are meaningless or to gut ones which have a long and honored history. I would say three very quick things in policy recommendations. 
First is, Celso Amarim, the former foreign minister, now defense minister of Brazil, said, we are not in the business of grading other countries. That's why he doesn't stand up for human rights. Okay. But who is our citizens? And uh, Ron, I don't know if you'll talk about this, but you know, there, is, there have been moments so far when, when citizens have been armed with information, and the case actually was uh, when Brazil developed its own sort of internet norms after the uh, Snowden effect, where Dilma and the Itamarachi said they were going to create norms similar to Russia and China. Citizens, though, took up sort of the cause and actually pushed the government, despite its own will, into creating a much more um, system of internet norms, um, which would not have done that. The second thing I think that's necessary to talk about, I talked about it last uh, in the earlier meeting, is the need for the media and others to be much more aware of what's going on. To recognize that these election observation missions are, you know, they're not just laughable, they're appalling. Um, that the inter-American human rights system, for example, as quickly I'll end on this, in the election of Pasmino and uh, Zaffaroni, the Ecuadorian and Argentine, the OAS refused to give a public hearing or vetting of these candidates among human rights groups. So it occurred without any sort of uh, process of public information and discussion. That's sort of, I think, where people begin to need to push back. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um... Well, now having covered various world regions, we'll move to the region of cyberspace. Uh, yeah, and uh, I just want to say thanks to Ned as well, and uh, just continue the theme where we seem to be prophets of doom up here. And, <laughs> uh, probably not going to change the tone. Um, my remarks are divided into three parts. I'm, I'm going to first talk about what trends I see in terms of norms in, in cyberspace around authoritarianism. I'll talk in the second part of my remarks about um, what are the causes or vehicles, why is this happening, and then I'll try to say some things about what is to be done. So first in terms of the trends, um, my remarks are drawn from the research of the Citizen Lab. Uh, how many people have heard of Citizen Lab here? Speak up a bit. How's that? Is that better? Okay, uh, my remarks are drawn from the research of the Citizen Lab. We've had a, about a decade's worth of experience documenting and analyzing information controls throughout the world, looking at cyber espionage, looking at internet censorship and surveillance, and the market for all of this. We use a mixed methods approach that combines uh, technical analysis and, and uh, drawn from computer science and engineering with social science, law, and field research. So we've, we've had a pretty good understanding of how things have evolved over the last decade. And in terms of authoritarian regimes and information controls, I think, I think in terms of three generations, at least three, maybe even four. Um, and when I say generations, I don't mean generations that are strictly temporal. In fact, uh, there are countries that may start with a third generation and then adopt the first later on. So it's more of a typology or a categorization, but I still think it's useful. Um, first generation controls are primarily defensive in nature and think of them in terms of uh, national level internet censorship regimes. China's Great Firewall is the archetypal example, this idea that we're going to build a border around our territory when it comes to information and prevent our citizens from accessing information that we don't want them to access abroad. Um, these are crude. They're relatively easy to get around and circumvent. Um, they're also very easy to document. In one of the projects that I helped direct, the Open Net Initiative, at one time we were testing for internet censorship in more than 75 countries around the world. Um, nonetheless, it's a norm that's growing worldwide. It's, it's become, I think, a de facto norm uh, that it's legitimate to do this. Of course, governments vary in terms of the type of content that they target for filtering. For some, it's just pornography. For others, it is pornography plus political information, social information, information about legitimate democratic opposition, information about human rights, uh, especially human rights critical of regimes in power. It's noteworthy that um, the technology that's used for internet censorship is also becoming more refined. A lot of it provided by Western it's, again, something that Citizen Lab has documented over the last decade. I'll give you one example that may surprise you. Pakistan, one of the world's most notorious censors of the Internet, uh, YouTube is inaccessible in Pakistan, has been for several years now, all of YouTube. Uh, the filtering is done using 
Canadian technology manufactured by a company called NetSweeper. Um, so this is a, a, a growing norm, but it's not the most important. I would say second and third generation controls are much more um, potent. So second generation controls, think of them as, as deepening and widening information controls further into society, deeper into society, through laws, regulations, standards, licenses, even informal pressures. Uh, so for example, we're seeing more and more the use of defamation, uh, copyright, essentially old media laws applied to the internet spaces, often in quite uh, audacious ways. Um, so there are many rights groups have documented arrests of bloggers and internet users and activists uh, for threats to royal families or criticisms of the military under the rubric of very old uh, defamation laws or national security laws. Uh, we're seeing the extension of registration policies to internet users, to organizations, real name registration, accompanying that restrictions on tools that provide internet security, uh, anonymity or circumvention, sometimes even being outright uh, outlawed. As part of the second generation control, very important characteristic of it is the loading of responsibilities to police the internet to the private sector. And this makes sense because, you know, when we talk about all of this technology, vast majority of it is owned and operated and manufactured by private companies. And so in order to control the internet, governments have to encourage or entice or uh, cajole the private sector to do their bidding for them. And this turns out to be uh, really quite elaborate and complex in and of itself, and in some ways very disturbing. So we're seeing companies uh, archiving, analyzing, and sharing information about their users with government security agencies, um, putting in place back doors that allow security agencies to get access to their communications when they want, um, turning over user data uh, without any judicial oversight. Uh, we've done a lot of research uh, on this topic in the Citizen Lab. I'll give you one really interesting example that's very lively for us right now. We've been looking at karaoke apps in Asia. Um, there, it turns out that karaoke, I didn't realize this, is really popular in China. The apps that are used uh, to access karaoke and to watch people singing karaoke, very popular. But also, as often the case in China, it's, it can be an outlet for criticism of the state or the regime or corruption. So we've been uh, looking at a number of these karaoke applications, reverse engineering them using technical means, and we found that built into these karaoke apps are tens of thousands of keywords that when you actually uh, type them in, they can trigger either censorship or more nefariously surveillance so directly sent to uh, government authorities. Um, now, it's important to understand, this is not something that's done by the Chinese government. The Chinese government will set an expectation or a level of standardization that companies then fall into line with. One of the other things we found is that censorship and surveillance varies widely from internet service provider and application. So you, if you use one application, and surveillance situation will be entirely different than another application, and that's because of the kind of uncertainty of around the standards that are set, but the expectation is that the private companies will do this sort of policing as a requirement to get an operating license in the country. Um, now, you can see why this is really quite significant, because it's a way for technical standards and operating practices to be established, which then can be exported abroad by the companies. Um, third generation controls are the most nefarious. Um, so if you think of first generation controls as primarily defensive in nature, building a border around your country, second generation deepening and extending those controls into society through the vehicle of the private sector, third generation controls are about going on offense, uh, going uh, the state or agencies of the state or uh, groups that are allied with governments going on the offensive to uh, take initiative. There are a couple of examples of this. One that has, get, has received a lot of attention recently are the pro-regime social media and blogger groups that you see sprouting up that are tacitly condoned or otherwise supported by regimes in Russia, China, Syria, Iran, and so on. Uh, it's really 
uh, a trend, I would say. And it's very useful for governments because it's a way for them to capitalize on social media um, and actually distance themselves a bit from some of the sentiment that may be expressed by these groups, giving them plausible deniability if they do something illegal or excessive. But it's also a convenient way to sow disinformation and create a, a climate of self-censorship and fear, um, especially when anonymous mass groups are used to out uh, activists and other organizations. More serious than the, the pro-regime social media groups under third generation controls, though, are targeted digital attacks. Citizen Lab has done a lot of research looking very carefully uh, using evidence-based approach, careful comparative studies of, of participating civil society groups. Um, we, did, we published a report last fall called Communities at Risk, the result of a, of a four-year study involving 10 NGOs of different sizes in different regions. Found, perhaps not surprisingly, that those uh, civil society organizations face persistent uh, targeted digital attacks on their infrastructure, on their devices. Um, maybe surprisingly uh, to some people in the room here, uh, the type of attacks they face are largely indistinguishable from those that we hear in the press that hit under company government agencies. In fact, uh, some of the very same threat actors are responsible for those attacks. The key difference, of course, is that civil society organizations have no, typically have very little or no capacity to deal with the problem financially or operationally, so they're left uh, hung out to and you very rarely hear policymakers at the highest level include civil society in remarks they make about threats of cyber espionage and cyber attacks. It's always threats to intellectual property, to governments and national security. Never do you hear, for example, President Obama say, oh, by the way, uh, APT that's hitting and, and our government agencies is also uh, something of serious concern to Human Rights Watch, to NGOs in all of the countries. It is a problem, and we've documented that. Um, going further, I would say, in the targeted digital tax area, a really big problem is the market for the products and services that allow governments to go out and purchase the tech to engage in these type of targeted digital attacks. I'm talking about companies that provide commercial spyware. Again, most of these are Western companies. Two that have been in the spotlight in recent years as a consequence of some of the research that we've done. Hacking Team, uh, based in Milan, Italy, uh, and Gamma Group and their Finn Fisher product. We found and, and have been able to trace and control servers related to these products to of governments around the world that are among the most notorious abusers of human rights. This is very sophisticated, off-the-shelf commercial spyware that allows uh, secret services to get inside the devices of activists and NGOs, track uh, their activities, and uh, often with deadly consequences. Um, now, fourth generation controls, I just added uh, in, when I wrote this, because it, it has occurred to me lately that there's another uh, phenomenon going on that's been touched upon by my fellow panelists here, and that is that you know we used to think of authoritarian regimes as primarily on the defensive. A lot of what we're seeing is them being much more audacious and bold and promoting norms. And this is certainly that I've seen happen in the cyber area, not in ways that most of the other internet experts There's a lot of hand-wringing in the internet freedom space about Will uh, China and Russia take over internet governance at these big internet meetings? Meanwhile, what they're missing is what's happening at lower level regional organizations like the like the Gulf Cooperation Council, where these countries are sharing best practices, developing joint strategies, right down to the nitty gritty of, of sharing technologies and blacklists and so on that Alex was talking about. That's really where the uh, important stuff is going on. Now, quickly, why is this happening? Well, I think there are several key factors here. We have a kind of perfect storm in cyberspace right now uh, that is contributing to all of this. Um, part of it is the, the fact that you have this enormous growth in terms of internet connectivity happening in the developing world. 
Uh, in some countries, on the order of a thousand percent per year connectivity. And this is, has been and is creating major governance challenges for a lot of these countries that lack capacity themselves, maybe failed states or uh, regimes, or maybe they've gone through recently a democratic transition and they see what's going on in terms of the example of the Arab Spring, colored revolutions. And for them, this is a real challenge. How do we deal with this? Um, the second factor has to do with cybersecurity and anti-terror uh, being uh, sweeping across the globe, really, in terms of major government priorities. Now, some of this, frankly, is legitimate. Obviously, I don't need to list out the number of security breaches that have happened in the cyber area or uh, extremist activities that are associated with the internet, both of which uh, require some kind of legitimate response. But the reality is when you look in the, in the fine uh, print, a lot of the, the um, laws, regulation, especially the institutions and practices that are being rolled out to address cybersecurity error, um, unfortunately, a lot of it gets directed towards what we would consider legitimate uh, political opposition or civil society. There's also a very important political economy dimension to all of this. Um, cybersecurity, anti-terror are, like it or not, big market opportunities. And there's a huge uh, industry around cybersecurity that I've called the cybersecurity military industrial complex. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars going into tools and tradecraft, cell phone tracking, social media monitoring, targeted digital attacks, espionage, and so on. And that market knows no boundaries. The hacking team revelations of the last week illustrate just how widespread uh, this market is. Last factor I'll talk about, and it's a, a bit of an uncomfortable one for especially people like me, is that we have to address the Snowden factor. Um, whatever you think of the disclosures of Edward, you can shelve that for a moment. We'll talk about some of the unintended that have happened for the topic that we're addressing on this panel, and I can see several of them really taken the wind out of the sails of the internet freedom and movement. Uh, it's really um, made the Western governments who have uh, made appeals on a rhetorical level about internet freedom ring kind of hollow. And, uh, that's created a kind of vacuum. I think it's also provided unintentionally a... I mean, revelation after revelation uh, provides essentially a blueprint of how to go about engaging in mass surveillance and targeted spyware. And we've been doing this for a long time. We have very well-defined, refined techniques. Uh, obviously, anyone looking at these revelations say, well, how do I get one of those myself? And that's <laughs> really something that you can see happening. And lastly, and cynically, they do provide an excuse or a rationale for uh, the imposition of domestic level controls under the rubric of technological protecting ourselves from NSA, et cetera, surveillance now means the uh, adoption of local technologies, local manufacturers of telecommunications equipment, which of course are more easily controlled. Uh, one minute for what we're gonna do about this. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, so that, I guess I, I would say there are just three, three areas I'd point to here. One is when it comes to the internet area, we have to get away from this idea of you know, everything debated and solved at these major internet governance forums. And, and I've stopped going to them. I think they're a bit of a red herring to this area, a distraction. A lot of effort is spent uh, trying to come up with some way to combat what's happening at these global meetings. Much more important are the local level phenomena and practices that are happening uh, at a country level. I think we need to extend transparency and accountability to the private sector in ways that go far beyond what we've done up until now, given the extent to which uh, many companies are now, maybe even in spite of how they feel they should be conducting themselves, pressured into essentially becoming uh, uh, an informal agency of regimes in terms of policing the internet. The only way to combat that is to continuously put pressure on those companies to be more transparent, more accountable ab about what they do, 
I uh, urge people to take a look at the transparency report that was published by the telecommunications company Telenor. It is really eye-opening country by country uh, overview of the laws and regulations they as a company face when it comes to treatment of customer data vis-a-vis -vis national security agencies. And then lastly, I think we need to get our own house in order. Um, this idea that the phenomena we're is something that happens way over there in another part of the world, I think is, is really mistaken. Uh, categorically, causally, the, the lines are blurring. Um, if you look at uh, most of the Western governments, uh, their policies on cybersecurity and anti-terror, uh, really re relaxing checks and balances, they're at the core of a liberal democracy. And I think we need to get that in, in shape first, otherwise we'll be fighting an uphill battle when it comes to addressing these problems in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and really thanks to all the speakers. I think these were uh, four excellent uh, presentations, and there's kind of a remarkable degree of consensus about um, how the problems are increasing and that, and that they somehow began only in the last uh, 10 years or so. And you know, it raises in my mind the question, how did we miss this happening? And so all of a sudden now everybody is aware of it. But as recently as two or three years ago, I think people uh, didn't see it coming. Um, so anyway, perhaps when we get to your final mm -hmm. remarks, you might have a word to say about that. But why don't I now open the floor to questions. Please identify yourself and your organization uh, when you begin. Go in the back first. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great presentation. My name is Mohammed Abdullah. I'm from the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. I work specifically in Syria. Alex and Steve, you, you talk directly the steps and the tools or the, the methods that repressive governments use to basically promote non-democratic values. And we've been aware of what's happening. I think what's missing here was the democratic country to counter these values. What we're doing to basically to say, no, the US and the EU and the Western uh, liberal democracies are countering this non-democratic values. Uh, quickly, I can say for the US government, for example, the inconsistency in the foreign policy toward Middle East, for example. We ignore what's happening in Bahrain and we resume our military assistance to Bahrain and then we welcome Sisi in Egypt, etc., etc. And basically we're sending the wrong messages to those guys that, hey, we really overlook what you're doing. And quickly, uh, getting our in order is an important thing because when I work in Syria and torture, for example, the good justification, the CIA is torturing, the Americans does it. And when we violate here and we have a decline and repression here in the US or in the migration policies in the EU, for example, or in different laws, it magnified 10 times worse in places like Middle East, Eurasia, and elsewhere. So we're not doing our part of the work as well. It's not only there's bad guys doing bad works. Thank you. I am Frank Alzana. I'm with the Center for, for Cuba. I have a question for Dr. Sabatini. Um, he, um, uh, of course, um, gave uh, an excellent overview of the situation in the Americas. And he mentioned Argentina and Brazil. And what about the United States? What is the United States doing in the context that you have uh, described? Chris, do you want to begin by responding to Yeah, forget it wasn't the question I was expecting, so thank you. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, uh, look, I, I'm um, uh, many good friends in this administration. I, um, I think uh, there is a piece I wrote uh, shortly after the first summit of the Americas um, in which I argued that, you know, Obama emphasized partnership, partnership, but partnership 
means in Latin America often cases the lowest common denominator. And partnership, partnerships needs, need leaders. And I think in some ways it's administration in Latin America. Um, when I say that, you know, I think it's, you know, it, it, just to get, cite that example, Obama went to the Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, he uh, was given a book by Hugo Chavez and got the thug hug. Um, by Chavez, uh, and then they went on to humiliate him at a meeting at the UNASUR, arguing that the U.S. was planning to uh, place more bases in Colombia, and they had a summit, and they denounced the United States. And there's been a whole series of these things. I think the U.S. Um, uh, I'll be, I'll be no pun intended, Frank in this case, but I, I, I supported the the changes on the Obama with with Cuba, but I do think that they will only work and only be effective if the okay, we did that. Let's get the I, I fear it won't do that, um, and I do think there has been a failure to lead in the hemisphere in an effort to overcorrect from the Bush years. It has sort of allowed itself to be held hostage to um, oftentimes the lowest common denominator. Okay, I respond to the other question to Alex. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Very quickly, I think what happens on the regional organizations front is, you know, we, we on the policy front, I, I think there's a perception that regional organizations, you know, deserve their own, um, um, you know, their own space, their own forms. And I think we're very late to sort of, you know, this issue of what kind of values do they embody. Um, and what I see is, is not so much a tendency to ignore, but to selectively engage and to project what we want to on regional organizations, right? So take the SCO, um, you know, this idea that somehow in 2009, the SCO could magically help be a partner in Afghanistan, right? This is something we, you know, administration tried to project and, you know, the other stuff, yeah, the rights, uh, no, we're, we're not gonna deal with that. I just think that that's the flawed model of engagement, right? If you're gonna engage, if you're gonna give these organizations the prestige that they want, especially given that a lot of them really do lack the capacity, um, then I think everything should be on the table, right? That the price of engagement should be robust engagement. And that's when I think the appeal to international standards on certain practices of concern uh, can inform the conversation. Uh, and and just, um, just a second point, I, I think Great powers, U.S. included, have always been hypocritical. It's one thing IR scholars sort of point out. The problem that the U.S. faces now is a kind of a global media where these inconsistencies are highlighted and magnified instantaneously, right? And so, yes, we have a very different policy in Bahrain uh, uh, and, uh, now than we do in other parts of the world. And I think, you know, Bill Crystal actually had a really bed back in 2005, right after the Andijan massacre called our Uzbek problem. And his point was, and he was no, didn't particularly care about Uzbekistan, but he cared about Iraq. And his point is, it's hard for us to promote what we're doing when there's a split scream and now over what's happening in Uzbekistan, right? And we're supporting. And I think that actually captures a real dynamic here, right? It's not the hypocrisy, it's just the magnification of it um, that we face, and that's very difficult to overcome. Sure, thanks. Both on this question of how did we miss these trends, could we have responded earlier if we'd been uh, attentive to them sooner, and the question from Mohammed about what the U.S. is doing to try to counter some of the trends that uh, were captured in the discussion so far today. I I'm not entirely sure that we did miss these trends. I, I, I think we did have an awareness of the emergent tactics that authoritarian regimes are using, certainly in the era to, um, to preserve authority, in particular during the, the Bush era in which democracy promotion was uh, pushed with uh, a very assertive and, and muscular um, uh, um, uh, policy uh, on the part uh, of the United States uh, is that when the Obama administration the office, there was a certain allergy to sustaining those policies. There was a pullback from uh, identifying democracy promotion as a critical priority for uh, for, for the United States certainly in the, in the Arab world. Uh, and, and it took some time after the start of the Arab uprisings 
for the Obama administration to come out publicly in support of the, the demands from below for uh, political change, for dignity, for economic justice. Once it became clear that these political openings were introducing into the region uh, very, um, very broad spread uh, uh, um, sort of patterns of, of political instability, of, of, of turmoil, uh, bringing to power actors who were seen as out of keeping with U.S. interests, there was a very, very quick kind of reversion to a strong U.S. preference for stability. Uh, once again, and and I think that also tended to hamper the capacity of the United States to adopt comprehensive strategies that might have uh, slowed and and perhaps reversed some of these trends that we've been discussing on the panel this afternoon. But I don't think it's a case of recognizing that these trends were were underway. Um, in terms of, of, of what is the U.S. doing, uh, I, I think what, what we see at the moment is that uh, concerns about instability in an environment of high uh, regional turmoil, um, widespread uh, uh, violent extremism, uh, they've really taken a back seat to a preference to securing a regional security environment. Uh, in which it's once again possible for regimes to stabilize domestically and to counter these threats from radical extremist movements. And so we've seen the continuation of military support to Egypt. We've seen the lifting of the embargo to Bahrain. Um, we've seen increase of the efforts by the Saudi government to take a more assertive role in um, in in uh, arenas like Yemen. And, and so overall, it, it seems to me that there's actually very little appetite within the U.S. government, at least at the moment, in adopting a posture to position the U.S. as a counterweight or as, as, as a force pushing back against some of the broader that, that were described uh, by myself and my colleagues here today. Let me comment uh, briefly on that. I mean, in the, in the Middle East, you had a situation where terrorism threats and geopolitics were at the center of the talking level of high politics. What I'm wondering is who was minding the store at the OAS, at the OSC, uh, in terms of American broadcasting abroad. You had I think the, the subject of, on which there's the most universal consensus in Washington is that American international broadcasting is broken and has been, and yet nobody does anything about these things. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, negligence, uh, inattention, people thinking, you know, these little soft power things don't really matter. I, I don't know, but. Uh, so that's different than, I mean, right. when the Middle East is blowing up, people look at it in, in a different way. So. Are there questions? Yeah, right here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is from the University of Chicago. And uh, my question is regarding Middle East, in particular Syria, so directed at uh, Stephen Heidemann. Um, so the focus of this discussion and authoritarian consolidation thus far has been on like a state and governmental level. Um, and yet there's something to be said on how the subject and the citizen himself and, and sort of consolidates authoritarianism as well, whether consciously or unconsciously. Um, so my question is, first of all, do you think that examining this consolidation of authoritarianism on a sort of citizen level, uh, bottom up sort of examination as important or important at all to the study of authoritarian upgrading or consolidation and second that at all? Other? Uh, yes, right here and then in the back. Hi, uh, picking up on, on one of the last comments. Can you me? identify yourself? Oh, uh, Bob Farron, I work, I'm a former Foreign Service officer, work as a consultant. I, I'm not a, attached to an institute. Um, <clears throat> With respect to the, the question of, of national norms that have been established in, in international organizations such as the OSCE and, and the OAS and, and 
UN uh, treaties. I'd like to know what the panelists believe the United States could and should do to uh, stiffen the spine of some of the, the middle powers and other influential actors with respect to the, the obvious uh, violations of such norms. Um, uh, perhaps you're what uh, Stephen Heidemann said about the current administration not being inclined to take a more active role is true, but, but as, as Mark Blattner mentioned, there, some of these violations at, um, <clears throat> that were mentioned in the discussion really should have been uh, pushed back against much more strongly by the international community. In the case of the OSC, what Putin has done in, in, in Georgia and Ukraine and so many other places um, really didn't get the reaction that you would have expected from other members of the OSCE. And with respect to the attempt to move the OAS to Argentina, uh, it's shocking, I find, that uh, Brazil and other uh, previously responsible members of the, uh, of the OAS even supported such an absurd proposal. So what would the panelists think the United States should and could do to uh, the international support for previously established international norms that are reflected in existing uh, international instruments. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Tijani Tugula. Um, I'm a Reagan Pencil Democracy Fellow. Thank you very much for your presentation. Actually, I would like to to know um, about uh, two points um, regarding the, IC, the use of ICTs and the censorship regarding them. The first one is, um, you know, you just suggest to increase the control on uh, what the private sector is doing um, for the government. So my concern is actually how um, civil society organization can, um, can control this situation if they actually can't access to any kind of information. For example, the private the private sector is it maybe is uh, you know it will get money from the government and they they will be like kind of protected by the government so nobody will know who actually is doing this the, from some person from the government will not take this and the second question is regarding uh, the NGO versus gone go um, particularly in the terms of um, social network today you know, it's complicated for um, NGOs, particularly if they are they don't have enough enough resources, financial resources, to to make impact or to reduce the impact of gone go. So, what what are your recommendations uh, regarding to those issues? And my last question actually is uh, is during the election, the um, today we are, you know, a lot of countries uh, in developing. Area are using uh, ICTs for election observation. Actually, we are not doing any. For most of them, also, we are not doing uh, statistic election observation. So when we have uh, the out, you know, the the outreach of the election come from the the civil society. For example, if they said we we don't agree with the result, they will just tell to the civil society. We are not interested in what you are doing because your data are not true. What are your recommendations to this kind of situation also? Thank you. Thank you. Let's very quickly take two more and then we'll give the uh, panelists all a chance to respond. Hi, uh, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist involved with a number of international NGOs. The coming months will see major on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, on funding for development, a number of other things. And picking up on the other question about international organizations, how can some of these international fora be directed in some ways to take up some of these issues of oppression of NGOs, of channeling aid to strengthening democracy, and making the UN not the hollow institution it's often seen. You will know the report that Madeleine Albright co-chaired with the former foreign minister of Nigeria. There is an attempt for serious thinking. Where can this be taken? Thank you. Louise Agriva with the grant-making program here at NED. I wonder if uh, you all agree with me uh, about 
a case of erosion of standards, and there ought to be a hue and cry for some of our own media outlets. Foreign Policy, foreignpolicy.com, for anybody who's on the email subscription list, has a number of sponsors. Everybody knows media need money, so the German Embassy or the Association of Graduate School Fairs sponsor, editor's picks sponsored by. And Russia Direct is in there as recently as July 2nd. Isn't that an outrage? Thanks. <laughs> Give each of our panelists a chance to respond to whichever of those questions uh, you would like and uh, add any concluding remarks. And since Alex Cooley has to leave at precisely 2 o'clock to catch a plane, I'll give him the uh, first opportunity. I, yeah, I apologize for that. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I would say, Mark, 2005, 2006 is the area in which a lot of these trends start happening. And, 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 and so much so, I actually started teaching a class, I ditched my globalization class and started <laughs> teaching a post-Western IR class because I thought in a lot of areas, economic architecture, development assistant, norms, human rights, politics, regional organizations, that's the pivotal time. And I think when you're in it, you don't recognize it. Or even two, three years out, you a blip. Okay, a second Freedom House report comes out talking about democratic deterioration. So it takes a few years, I think, to recognize it as a trend. And, and, and now I think, you know, we've identified it that, you know, I like Steve's, this isn't just about sort of <laughs> little moments of sort of soft power. There's something, the whole is greater than just the sum of these things now. When you put together all these stories about patronage and media and norms and regional organizations um, and so forth. So I think it's great that we have both kind of scholarly engagement, policy making engagement with it. And just, you know, on, on the OSC and, and, and the standards, I think standards have to be sharpened and I think they need to be clarified. And I think in terms, in, in, in many cases, in many of these organizations, there are uh, references to international norms, to the UN, to international law. So these organizations need to be uh, uh, taken at their word. And I think, again, that should be part of the engagement um, agenda when we deal with them. It's not just can we get cooperation on AFPAC or can we get cooperation on this particular sort of negotiation of deal that, you know, real engagement is sort of robust engagement, sort of they expand the range of issues as opposed to sort of limiting them. And that, to me, that's, that's the only way to it. But it's, it's, it's very difficult in this environment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go to Steve next? Sure. Thanks very much for the question uh, about whether there is a need to look at this whole issue of counter norms from the perspective of what's happening at the level of society from, from the bottom up. And I think, I think there absolutely is, because it's clear that, that uh, society is an arena of significant contestation around the consolidation of these counter norms. Uh, I mentioned that uh, that we have seen the emergence of these law and order constituencies in the region. I think these have expanded and become much more vocal and to some extent much more uh, militant in the period since, since 2011. And there's no question that leaders like Sisi and others count very heavily on the legitimacy they can claim as a result of they receive from segments of Egyptian society in this case, but Egyptian society in other cases, that express very strong support for the measures that they've put in place in order to restore social peace. And so we do very much need to be aware of this. These, these um, constituencies have, as I said, expanded significantly. Um, but it, it's important also to be aware that these constituencies have expectations, that they are not going to remain as sympathetic to the claims of authoritarian leaders about their capacity to guide societies through periods of very, very high turmoil and insecurity uh, if they're not able to demonstrate that they're able to do so effectively. And I think that the odds are pretty high that in expressing claims about their ability to manage economies more effectively and expressing claims about their abilities to keep their citizens safe from terrorism and expressing claims about their ability to create domestic stability that will permit
the restoration of law and order and for people to go about their normal lives in environments of security, that they will largely fall short. I think they will grow, bump into increasing problems um, that will highlight gaps between the claims they use to legitimate themselves and conditions on the ground. And that could create openings for much more powerful challenges to emerge, alternatives to emerge, for potential new coalitions to emerge as some disaffected former law and order constituencies begin to look for partners that they feel might give them a better chance of achieving their objectives. There's a counter possibility, which is that for a regime that or that that defines insecurity as a critical justification for its existence, the persistence of insecurity can reinforce those claims. So we have to be aware that this isn't going to be a straightforward dynamic, but it's one in which I think these regimes do exhibit vulnerabilities that will become more apparent over time if their performance falls short. And one of the real policy challenges for folks in the region and in Washington is uh, both to be watching for, monitoring, and assessing those those changes in 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 or, or the 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 increase in the vulnerability of these regimes, and to have at hand pro strategies and policies that are able effectively to leverage those moments to insert alternative narratives and alternative visions of what politics could be like in those cases into public debate. Chris? So a few uh, reactions. One is, um, to go to your bigger comment, uh, Mark, is you know I think why it took us so long to, to recognize this. There's one reason, well, there's a number of reasons. One is I think it, you, people needed to connect the dots. There are little examples here and there of, of whether it's you know the, the abysmal performance of the last Secretary General of the OAS, Many people sort of attributed that to him, um, and so it sort of took. And rise of China, I think it, it it took a while to see what was actually happening. And the second point along those lines is that I think most people sort of chalked some of this up to a certain amount of, in, in the region I work on, buffoonery. Um, you know, you had another example of Hugo Chavez, the Banco del Sur, which if. If you have a, an account there, I wouldn't expect to cash out on any time soon. Um, the, um, so there was a certain sense that oh, this will never happen. It's, it's, you know, we just didn't take it seriously. Um, and the last is a point that Alex made in a previous meeting, which is I, I think that we, we had a certain bias. So we believe that it's, it's liberals who create norms and institutions. That you know, the, the idea that there'd be a regime or regional building project that would be counter norm is sort of counter logical. Uh, we, that doesn't happen. Which gets me to sort of the question you'd ask: What can be done? a question you would have alluded to as well. I think there are two things. One is at the level of public information. I alluded to it earlier. Is I, I think in, in Latin America, uh, civil society and the media, and, and, and media owners will admit this now, now that they see they're under attack, especially in Ecuador, they lack a certain capacity to learn and, and want to uh, and report on what's and their foreign policies of their own countries. That simply is not the way they've been organized. They've been focused in battling for human rights and expansion of rights in the last several decades internally. And the, the sort of new muscular foreign policy is relatively new in the region. So the, the, the civil society and media haven't caught up. Um, so I, I think what has to happen more and more is that, and, and I'm saying this because we have a project that's doing this, so it, it, it is self-serving, in full disclosure, is you know tracking what doing in the OAS and the rising votes. I mean, Brazil voted against a number of declarations of human rights in the UNHRC on Syria, Brazil. So and that is not known in these countries. As I mentioned, you know, in the case of Brazil and the internet uh, regime, once citizens push back, uh, they backtracked. When they realize we don't want to be China or Russia, don't ally yourself, ally, your, ally yourself with them, they push. And I think that has to happen, is it has to happen from a grassroots information level, because I don't think that capacity exists. The other is, and, and I raise this, a provocative suggestion because I realize it, it, it's maybe it is time to sort of begin to open up and revisit some of these norms. I mean, they have, not to you know, trash them, but you know, I'm not even calling for a full Bretton Woods of human rights norms, but you know, they have existed. They're tied, they're seen by the global south as being very tied to the uh, re international regime. Maybe it's time to begin face to face begin to negotiate with some of these countries about how to build these up. And the perfect case in point, which I didn't talk about, is to say the IMF, where we've given, Brazil now has more, contributes more, but its ability, its voting power, 
share has not increased because of the US Congress. So what does it do? Now it's allying itself with the BRICS Bank and also with the AIIB um, because it basically was shut out of an expanded role in, in, uh, um, you know, in the IMF. I'm not saying we should give them carte blanche to do whatever they want in the IMF. I mean, certainly they also want a seat in the Security Council and they've abstained in votes over Iraq, uh, Syria, um, Libya. So clearly that has to, but with, to quote the great movie Spider-Man, with, with power comes responsibility. And I think <laughs> we, they need to step up to do that. Thank you. And Rob, yeah. well, I, I see that we're over time, so I'm gonna have to be brief. And I'll, I'll just say, I, I think that we need to do a better job of what we preach would be my message. And, and that really down to, in my area at least, thinking about ways to address the militarization of cyberspace, put a, a much greater emphasis on civilian approaches to cybersecurity, build transparency and accountability mechanisms for the private sector, and do some things like that may seem obvious, but we, I think, are losing just to encourage independent investigators uh, more academic research that's also independent of governments and the private sector, and legal research as well. And uh, those are things that we can control, and I think in the long run at least it will have a big impact. Thank you. Perhaps in responding to this question, also following on that, uh, and also uh, doing a little self-advertisement as well, uh, I would call your attention to a, another article in this issue, uh, which is entitled uh, Europe and Azerbaijan, the End of Shame. And it tells a remarkable story of how uh, Azerbaijan was able to manipulate the Council of Europe to uh, prevent it from condemning its uh, growing and ever more egregious uh, human rights uh, violations. And part of it is, I think, when those kinds of things happen, People have to be called to account. So anyway, it was a great panel. Thank Thanks. you all for Thank participating. You. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.